Good morning. Thank you for coming to our Living with Wildlife presentation. My name is Angela Thorpe. I'm the chairman of the Board of Health here in East Long Meadow. Um, we want to talk a little bit about the coyotes and the, with the recent sightings, we felt that this would be a good time to invite some presenters uh, to provide information that will keep us and the wildlife safe as we cohabitate together. Special thank you to Nick Balboni and Don Mackey from LCAP for taping this informational presentation for the citizens of East Long Meadow. Our presenters today will be our own Tom O'Connor, who is East Long Meadow's certified animal control officer and animal inspector. He's been with us since June of 2011. Also will be Trina L. Maruzzi. She is a wildlife biologist for the Massachusetts Division of Fishery and Wildlife. She has 13 years experience under her belt. So we're looking forward to hearing from them and we'd like to thank both of them for taking the time to keep us safe and informed. And with that, Tom, would you like to take over? Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. I'd like to start out with just a, 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 an overview of animal control laws and uh, issues that we have in town. And this all ties into the presentation that uh, Trina will be doing in, in uh, a few minutes after my presentation. It has to do with how to keep your pet safe with regards to wildlife. It's one of the common questions I get regarding uh, residents in town. And uh, I put together a few slides here, which will hopefully educate you to make sure that you can do the, the most you can to keep your pets safe. First thing is vaccinate your pets against rabies. That's the first and foremost thing that you can do as residents who own pets, whether they be cats or dogs. Vaccinations save the animal's lives. License your pet, your dog, each and every year and provide them with a collar to hang their tags. One of the most common things we see is that a dog will pick up a stray and the animal doesn't have a collar, is not wearing his tags, and we don't know where to bring them. If you license your dog, our goal is to get them back to you as quickly as possible to alleviate the stress that you feel and the animal feels from being separated. We like to provide you also, uh, you can provide us with a number to reach you at 24 hours a day. Another common issue that we deal with is folks give us daytime numbers and they may be out working, shopping. So if their animal does escape, we can't reach them and we end up bringing the animal to our shelter. And of course the stress level is there for everybody again. The last thing is when you're out for a walk, keep your pets on a, on a leash no longer than six feet. One of the things that we see often is that folks use those retractable leashes that go out 15 feet. Those are nice when you're in your yard, but when you're out on a street, that's dangerous to the pet and dangerous to you. The pet can easily move into traffic, enter someone else's property and be attacked by their animal. So it's it, it makes sense to keep, uh, keep them on a short leash and keep them in your control. It also prevents wildlife from feeling that they can advance on your animal without you being uh, able to interact. Okay. Also, spay and neuter both cats and dogs. Uh, by spaying dogs, it helps to uh, keep them from roaming. Cats, it's important to spay near the cats so they don't uh, get out into the general population and uh, help to, uh, it helps to eliminate the need and the concern we have with feral cat populations and the breeding. Keep a watchful eye on your pets, especially your small ones, even when they're in your own yard. Unless you have a large enough fence and you have a secure boundary on your property. It's not going to prevent wildlife from coming on your property. If you let a small dog or a small cat go outside, they could be uh, in harm's way. Never let your pet uh, get near or interact with a wild animal, dead or alive. You don't know how this animal uh, is. You don't know if it's diseased, injured, and you don't know how it's going to react. So no matter how friendly they are, stay away. I put together some information uh, from uh, 
some of the CDC websites that has to do with uh, some of the issues that we have and to show you the importance of making sure you vaccinate your animals. Rabies and domestic animals uh, through this period of time, as you can see, start, has gone down and it's gone down through the activities of animal control officers, animal inspectors in, in working with the state to make sure that all the pets are vaccinated and help reduce the amount of uh, and the number of rabies that the state uh, sees. Rabies in wild animal, as you can see, is a, bit, is a different issue. It goes all over the place. If you look at the more, more prominent issue we have, it's with the raccoons. In Massachusetts, the second bee in skunks, and then foxes closely follow. Uh, bats, in general, are the number one carrier of rabies. This is um, a map of the United States, and it kind of shows uh, the terrestrial uh, layout of the different animals and it shows on the East Coast it's mainly raccoons that are the problem. Again, bats must also be considered. And I like to stress here that if there's a bat in your home and you're sleeping and you wake up and you find a bat in your home, it's important to do what you can to try to catch that bat, contain it, because you must assume you've been bitten and you don't know the status of, of the bat. So catch the bat, contain it, and uh, call your animal control officer and we can take it from there. Human rabies has gone down. As you can see in 2010, it, it fluctuates between two and zero in uh, 2001. This slide uh, shows a number of animals obviously in different settings and ones that don't normally interact with each other. But what it does tell you is that uh, f folks are concerned with uh, do birds carry rabies? The answer is no. Do reptiles carry rabies? The answer is no. Mammals, fur-bearing uh, mammals are the ones that are prevalently uh, animals that carry rabies. Like the cat, is the number one carrier of rabies in domestic animals, and dogs number two. Here's a listing to show you uh, the study that shows in June 30, 2009, by the Mass Department of Public Health, raccoons again, of those tested positive and those that were tested. And again, if you go through the list, it shows raccoon, skunk, bat, cat, fox. So the cat is way up there. So if you have a cat, again, I just want to stress, make sure you vaccinate your cat, whether it's indoor or outdoor. Transmission of rabies is through saliva injected via bites or scratches. And you can also get it by rubbing the fur of your pet and rubbing your membranes like your eyes or putting your finger in your mouth. cannot be spread by blood, urine, feces, or skunk spray. It doesn't mean that it doesn't contain some other contaminant. So always handle your pets safely after a fight with wildlife or with another animal. Wear gloves, wash your hands. As you can see, touching the mucous membranes, open wounds on hands. A lot of folks uh, have hand cuts where their skin is dry and the skin cracks. Those are open wounds that the uh, uh, rabies virus can get into <coughs> and no documented cases of human rabies from indirect exposure which goes back to the petting of the animal but still it's a concern that you need to keep in mind. Obviously to avoid exposure avoid being bitten. Wear gloves to avoid contact with the saliva and protect any open wounds on your hands. First step, if you feel there's been some exposure, is to wash your hands immediately for a minimum of 10 minutes. Contact your physician or your ER department. Call the Mass Department of Public Health Division of Epidemiology that's listed there. And they can give you some of that information later on if you choose to have that number. And contact your local police department or animal control officer and we will respond to assist you. Here are the contact. Uh, information for these departments. The first is for human exposure and the green 
The second card is for the animal exposure. And when you call these numbers, they're very knowledgeable, and they will help and assist you through the process of helping you make the right decision for yourself and for your pets. And here's our contact information. Animal Control, if you need to reach me for a complaint or emergencies, call East Long Metal Police Department at the number listed, and dispatch will call me and get me uh, out to your area. General questions, call the Board of Health Selectman's Office at the number listed. If you have questions on farm animals or how many pets can you have in your home, general questions like that, they will help assist you with that or contact me and I can give you a call back. That's a portion of my presentation. I'd like to uh, turn it over to uh, Trina Maruzzi, uh, our state wildlife biologist, who will handle the presentation on coyotes and wildlife in general. Thank you. So again, I am Trina Moruzzi. Um, I've been asked to talk a little bit about coyotes. I understand that there has been some incidents um, in East Long Meadow, and so that has prompted Tom to, to contact the Division of Fisheries and Wildlife, and, and I will speak about um, a little bit about the biology of coyotes in Massachusetts, their history as to how they came here, and then also some of their habits, um, and then some of the do's and don'ts of living with coyotes. But it also pertains to many, many different types of suburban wildlife um, in Massachusetts. So that's what I'll talk about today. And then at the end, we'll have some time for questions, because I'm sure you all have questions to ask of us. Coyotes are basically a medium size animal. Uh, they tend to be anywhere from 25 to 50-ish pounds. Uh, their coat coloration can be very variable. It can be the, that gr typical grizzled gray color, but it can also be a very black coloration very reddish, um, as well as very blonde, even within the same litter. They are very common throughout Massachusetts, uh, but they are quite shy and elusive. They don't tend to like people. They can be active day or night, especially this time of year when there's not as much food out there, so they have to search a little bit longer to find food resources. Um, and they are active year-round. They do not hibernate like other animals do. This time of year, they're pretty much ending up, uh, finishing up their breeding season. Their breeding season goes from January through March. Right about now, they're starting to think about denning. Uh, the female will, uh, she will find a den. She will pair up with the male um, on a seasonal basis. They will both raise the young, and the young are born sometime April through May. The young stay with the, the two adults um, throughout July and August. The adults at that point in time start to teach the young how to hunt um, and, and be out and about more. By early fall, September to November, that's generally when the adults will kick them out of their territory and so they have to go find their own territory. If there are lots of uh, food resources available, the adults, the young may stay with the adults through the fall and winter. So, when we talk about a, a coyote population, it really consists of a family unit. It's not like a pack, like a wolf pack, that um, consists of unrelated individuals. Um, the family unit in a, in a home range area consists of the two adults, which are kind of the alpha male, the alpha female. They're young of that year, as well as sometimes the young of the previous year. So if one of those adults gets taken out um, of the area, another one will come in within a fairly short amount of time. So you will also have transient animals, animals that are unrelated to that family unit that are traveling through the area. They're using a much larger population, uh, home range size. Um, the family unit 
In a typical town like East Long Meadow, where it's a suburbanized town, they may be using anywhere from six to 10 square miles. So most of the town. Um, these transients that kind of come through the area looking for their own home ranges, they may be traveling upwards of you know, almost 200, 200 miles. So they're just finding their own area, getting kicked out of the area by these family groups. As I said before, if one of the adult pair gets taken out, whether it gets hit by a car or gets harvested during hunting season, within a year's time, there will be another adult that will replace that individual. Um, and so it's always going to be this shift in the, that adult pair. And it may be, you know, the young will step up and will uh, mate with the female as well. But it consists of that family unit. As I said before, um, their home range size really relates to prey abundance, how much food they can find within their area that they're using of home range. Um, in the more rural areas, the forested areas, say western Massachusetts, they may be using upwards of 20 square miles as opposed to more suburbanized areas like East Long Meadow, where, like I said before, they're using a smaller area parts or all of a town, six to 10 square miles. So as long as they can find those food sources, um, they're gonna be adapting to live in fairly urbanized areas. We find them um, all over the state now, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Coyotes howl, and we know this, and you might've heard this during the winter time and this time of year, they don't do it for malicious reasons. They howl for communication. It may be members of that family group that are communicating with other members of the group, um, letting them know where they are, vocalizing, I'm over here, where are you? Or they may also be vocalizing, saying um, to those transients, this is my area, you get out of the area, We're, this is our area. And lots of times, I don't know if you've ever heard a, a fire engine siren go through, and all of a sudden the coyotes will start howling, they think it's an unrelated coyote, and so they're basically telling that fire engine, hey, this is my area, you stay out. So they don't, they're not going to be howling um, when they're chasing after prey. If you could think about it, if you're hunting, you're not going to want to be making lots of noise when you're hunting. Um, to take a little bit step back in time, coyotes didn't enter Massachusetts until the 1950s. They were more of a Midwestern prairie species. And in that point in time, um, with, the, with the loss of major predators, um, such as wolves and mountain lions, they started to expand eastward into the eastern United States. And they came into, um, into Massachusetts in the 1950s. And these are the first records of coyotes that were shot in Massachusetts, the first one being in Otis in 1957. Well, as time passed on, more and more came into the state on their own, um, and so they started to expand eastward. Again, down in eastern Massachusetts and down in southeastern Massachusetts, they started to expand in the 1990s. And their current population, they are found in every town in Massachusetts except for the vineyard in Nantucket. It's a little bit too far for them to swim out there. We have had um, a couple of dead coyotes wash up on the, on the beach of Martha's Vineyard, but there hasn't been any evidence of any that are living on those islands. But they're found in very, very urban Boston. They're found in very, very urbanized areas, as well as throughout the state. So they're very common <coughs> throughout the state. So what kind of habitat do they use? Um, as I said before, they originally um, started in um, inhabited the grasslands and prairies of the Midwestern United States. But they've adapted to really um, utilize all sorts of different types of habitats, and it really relates to food sources, as long as they can find those food sources. So these are all typical habitats of the eastern coyote in Massachusetts. Coyotes are opportunistic, so they're not going to seek out everybody's cat in a neighborhood. It takes a lot of energy to hunt, to be a hunter, to be a predator. So they're looking for the easy food sources. Um, and unfortunately, you know, they are omnivorous, which means they'll eat meat, they'll eat fruits and vegetables, 
depending on the time of year, they'll utilize whatever food resources are out there. In the springtime, they'll find young of the year. Uh, in the summertime, they'll utilize a lot of berries, a lot of fruits. In the fall, they'll eat apples. Um, but we also know, and they, we know they'll take cats. Again, they're looking for that easy food source. And outdoor cats, unfortunately, become part of the neighbor, part of the environment. And there's a lot of threats to outdoor cats, not just coyotes, but the neighborhood foxes, neighborhood fishers, uh, great horned owls will take cats. So there's a lot of threats um, to cats that are outdoors. They'll also find out when trash day is. And so they're a learned animal. So they will learn when the trash gets put out on the stoop or out at the end of the driveway. Um, and so we, you know, we tell people, you need to keep your pet trash picked up. Again, they are an opportunistic animal. Again, um, we do value coyotes for many, many different reasons. Ecologically, they are an important part of the environment. Um, they keep small mammal populations down because they're a predator. Um, and as a result, that also helps to keep you know, diseases down that small mammals might carry and medium animals. And that, in turn, helps to keep things like songbird populations up uh, that may be affected by those small and medium predators that they may be driving out of an area. They also have intrinsic value, which means they are important just because of the fact that they are out in the environment. They have their own value as a natural resource. Many people do like to see coyotes. They like to see nature. They enjoy viewing wildlife. Um, and it provides us with an educational, educational experience to, to try to teach the general public you know, about wildlife, about coyotes, and understanding their habits and understanding how to live with these animals, because there's, there's really no getting rid of coyotes in the state. Um, they are considered a fur bear resource, so they are harvested for their fur. There is both a trapping and a hunting season on coyotes. The hunting season has just ended. Um, we set the hunting season such that it utilizes um, the animal when, they are, when their pelt value is the highest. And uh, hunters and trappers enjoy that recreational opportunity. So let's talk a little bit about some of the conflicts that people experience with coyotes. And you know, we do know that there are conflicts. And there are some things that neighborhoods can do to kind of do's and don'ts of living with these animals in Massachusetts. Why do, why do we have conflicts with coyotes? Well, one might be that they are so adaptable to live in very, very, as I said before, urbanized areas, as long as they can find many, many different types of food resources. Uh, their habits, you know, they can live in very, very, you know, urbanized backyards and people, and especially this time of year, when it's ending up in their breeding season, their, their breeding season's ending, this is one of the times of year that they are most visual. And that might be a little disturbing for neighborhood residents to see them in their backyards. Also, their behaviors. You know, they are a learned animal. They learn to adapt to live close to people. Um, you know, the general presence of, of coyotes doesn't put up a red flag. You know, we know they use these areas very often. Um, and they're seen occasionally, they're heard howling. Lots of times you hear howling, it sounds like there's about 15 of them out there, but it's far fewer than what it actually sounds like. But, um, oftentimes, again, because they're so adaptable, we find that they will den in residents' yards, especially if you have a brushy area out behind your yard. Um, and they can carry diseases. Um, and again, that does cause conflicts. As Tom had said before, this is why it's very, very important for you to keep your pets uh, vaccinated against disease. They can carry rabies. As you saw on his list, there's only been 10 cases of rabies ever in Massachusetts with coyotes. It's very, very rare. Uh, but they also can carry canine distemper. The symptoms of distemper is not that different from rabies. Um, they can carry mange, which can affect um, your neighborhood dog. And there are other types of worms. So that's, those are some of the disease conflicts that people encounter with them. 
Some other conflicts include property damage um, due to unsupervised pets. As I said before, outdoor animals unfortunately become part of the environment and they're not always on top of the food chain. We've also had uh, attacks on livestock, sheep especially, um, and, and crops as well. Again, because they're so opportunistic, if they can find um, a food crop, they might get into it as well. But it generally tends to be an individual that is causing a problem. They might get a little bit more bold or a little bit, you know, they lose their fear of humans. It doesn't, it's not typically the whole population. In general, coyotes are weary of people. Um, and it tends to be an individual animal that might be causing these conflicts. Another conflict that we have with people is habituation. When they start to be acclimated to human presence, when they lose that fear of humans. Just because they're seen in a neighborhood doesn't mean they're habituated, but we start to see a pattern of behavior. Um, and that habituation also occurs when there's a lack of threats. People are not aggressively trying to haze these animals to harass these animals when they see them. There's unnatural food sources. People are feeding their pets outside or putting food directly outside. That's when, or, or unsupervised garbage, that sort of thing. That's when you start to get habituation. Also, when that behavior is rewarded, and I know as crazy as it seems, some people like to see them and they will put food out directly for them and that just cannot happen. So again, what I said before, what leads to habituation is that direct feeding, feeding wildlife directly, not just coyotes, it can be other forms of animals. If you're feeding your pets outside, you're feeding the local wildlife, you're feeding the local skunks, you're feeding the local raccoons, the local foxes. So all of those animals can become habituated as well. There can also be habituation due to indirect feeding. Um, as we said all along, the feeding pets outdoors, Bird feeders, you don't think about bird feeders, but it not only attracts birds to bird feeders, it also attracts squirrels, which is one of their main uh, food sources, um, and other small mammals. Again, leaving garbage outside can attract these animals, um, as well as gardens and fruiting plants. As, again, they are opportunistic, so depending on the time of year, they're gonna find all sorts of different food sources. And again, that lack of harassment, it really needs to be a community-wide effort, and we'll talk about this in a few minutes, um, harassing these animals when they are seen. So what are some of the public safety issues with, con with coyotes? Well, it's those habituated habi individuals. Um, and again, it tends to be the individual, not the entire population. And we start to see a pattern of behavior with these in habituated individuals. We start to see attacks on leashed pets, not just pets that are left outside or that are roaming on free. We start to have an individual that starts to attack animals on the leash. Um, and that, you know, at, at the end result may be an attack on people. But we have to put that into perspective. People attacks, it's very, very rare. There have only been five attacks on people ever in Massachusetts. Two were confirmed rabid animals. A third was a, a suspected rabid animal. Um, a coyote came out of the blue, bit a little girl, and took off into the woods. It was not able to be captured, but that behavior um, is very, very typical of rabies. So we believe there were three rabid animals that it attacked people, and they were bites to people. And then there were also two other incidents of habituated individuals that have attacked people. So you have to put it into context. We know of hundreds of dog attacks on people every year. They don't see people as prey. There have only been five attacks ever on people by coyotes. So we have to kind of put it into context. It's very, very rare. So what can we do as a community to try to keep these conflicts at a minimum? Well, one is modification of habitat, modification of human behavior. You know, again, you gotta clean up your yard, make sure that there aren't any food sources available for them, uh, cut the brushy edges of your yard where um, the young, the small animals like to inhabit, 
things like squirrels and mice, that's their primary prey sources. Um, you might think about fencing your backyards. Fencing for coyotes needs to be a minimum of six feet high. Um, and good husbandry pr practices. Keep your chickens you know, in a coop at night um, or during the day if you know that there are animals um, around. Again, all these don't just pertain to coyotes, they pertain to all the neighborhood wildlife. So the things that I'm going to talk about right now pertain to the local skunks, the local uh, raccoons, the local fishers, the local foxes, all those animals that you may have in your backyards. And finally, tolerance. You know, we can, if there is an individual animal, that can be dealt with, but there's really no getting rid of suburban wildlife, of these animals from the population itself. So we need to learn the do's and don'ts of living with these animals to have these conflicts at a minimum. Um, as we said before, you need to eliminate those feeding sources, those sources that, of food that attracts them into neighbors' backyards. Um, as I said before, keep your garbage clean um, in tight containers, use compost bins, remove bird feeders, and then never directly feed a coyote. So again, they are a learned animal. They learn when trash day is. So keep them in containers that people can't, that coyotes can't get into. Compost piles, again, because they're opportunistic, they'll eat pretty much anything. So they will get into food compost. So keep compost in compostable containers that animals can't get into for, for many different wildlife species. <coughs> again, as I said before, bird feeders, attract small mammals, and many of these species, that is their primary prey source. Our squirrels, our mice, things that the seed falls to the ground, um, and that attracts squirrels and mice. This time of year, we're almost into April when bears are going to start to be um, coming out of their dens. And so it's by mid-April that we tell people, you know, you need to take in those, those bird feeders because bears are going to be coming out of their dens looking for food as well. So again, lots of different neighborhood wildlife that, um, that will be affected by bird feeders. Modification of habitat, as I said before, um, make yards less attractive to them. Eliminate their den sites. You know, we'll find a lot of times people will call us they have a fox or a raccoon living under their deck under their shed and that that is the case sometimes for coyotes as well if they don't feel threatened in an area and there's food sources around they may be hiding under um, or denning under sheds and decks and so you know you may want to fence off underneath those areas so that animals can't get underneath to to, uh, to den as i said before cut back those brushy areas those um, offer hiding places for coyotes, for neighborhood wildlife, as well as their prey. And then as Tom talked about before, please, you need to keep your pets leashed and supervised. Um, you know, as I said, I've kind of said this all along, outdoor animals become part of the environment. So it is important for us, especially if you live in an area where there are coyotes known to be inhabiting your neighborhood, you need to be able to supervise those animals. Uh, we do get calls about, you know, attacks on cats, attacks on dogs. It tends to be the smaller dogs um, that coyotes will most likely size up. You know, they'll come into a yard. They'll say, hey, it's a small dog. I can take you. This is my territory. And the domestic dog does, it sees the domestic dog as another canid species, another s species in its territory. And so it's going to say, hey, I can take you. Um, and so it might attack the dog. The dog doesn't understand that behavior, and it's just trying to defend its house as well. So that's where it's very important um, to keep your dogs leashed and supervised. And we have, sometimes we've had some calls of some small dogs, unfortunately, that think they're a lot larger than they are, and they take off after the animals. And again, the animal's going to protect its territory and defend itself as well. And we talked about outdoor cats becoming part of the environment. Uh, pet food outdoors, as I said before, uh, again, attracts lots of different suburban wildlife, neighborhood wildlife. So don't let coyotes intimidate you. They're here. They're here to stay. Uh, those animals that are being seen during the daytime, you know, that are visual in people's backyards, we need to have a neighborhood-wide effort to harass them when we can. You can't let them intimidate you. You can't let them take over your lives. 
Um, so what are some of the things that we can do for harassment? Well, an important one is loud noises. Anything that might spur them to, to keep their distance, to run away. And they may not run away automatically, especially if they're, they've lost their weariness, they're finding food in an area. Uh, but things like, you know, air horns, pots and pans, a whistle, those are always good to have. You bring a whistle with you when you're going on a walk. Um, throw small objects, throw a tennis ball at them if you can. If you can get close enough, squirt them with a water hose. Again, not just for coyotes, but this works for the neighborhood fox or the neighborhood fisher as well. And you need to vary your techniques. So if you have a floodlight that comes on at night when an animal comes into a backyard, they'll learn pretty quickly that's not going to hurt them. So it might be something where you have, to, you have to vary your techniques and do different things to deter them from utilizing your backyard. And they may learn to use, you know, it, it may be a travel corridor between, you know, if, if there's woods behind your backyard, they may learn, okay, I don't want to use this backyard at the same time when people are out there, but they, might, they will start to avoid it when people are out there and they, you know, or they'll avoid your, lawn, your yard um, altogether. But it really needs to be a neighborhood-wide effort because all of your good efforts of doing all these har harassment techniques and all the feeding, trying to keep feeding away from your yard is really futile if your neighbor is not doing the same thing. So that's where it really is a neighborhood-wide effort. And I said before, we really need to learn to live with these animals. It's their individuals that can cause problems, not the population as a whole. And it's better to be proactive than reactive. So every time you see them, if you don't want them in your backyards, you know, be harassing them, making sure that you have no food sources that might be attracting these animals. So that's important too. What can children do? As I said before, children are not seen as prey. They are, they are not typically they are not seen as prey to these animals um, but there are some do's and don'ts for children as well when they encounter coyotes they should make themselves look bigger you know open their jacket flap it don't you know you don't want to give them that running instinct you don't want to run away you just back slowly away go get mom or dad or your babysitter um, and they and the and the adults should be the one that should be harassing the animal out of the air we don't usually typically uh, have children harass animals. Um, and then finally, you know, our goal is really to work with communities to resolve these conflicts. And it tends to be, as I said before, individual animals that are pr usually making these conflicts. Um, another important part of our management is through that regulated hunting and trapping season where we can try to um, have some control over wildlife populations. We do have um, a regulated problem animal control program where if there are individual animals that are causing conflicts that are definitely being a nuisance, there are problem animal control individuals that can come out and they can deal with those animals. Um, it's a lot easier for things like skunks and raccoons, uh, but with coyotes there are certain individuals that are licensed to deal with coyotes. Again, just because you have a coyote in, an air, in a neighborhood does not mean that is a, a problem animal. Um, it's, it's in certain problem in situations that you could call a package. And it usually typically is in coordination with the town police that that happens. Um, we also provide public education, and that is very important for us um, through our Living with Wildlife series. We have, some, um, we have some handouts over here that Tom has graciously printed out for you to all take. They are wonderful handouts about all these do's and don'ts of living with coyotes. We have different pamphlets on different species. Uh, we have ones on foxes. We have ones on fishers. We have ones on kind of a general suburban wildlife. And they're all found on www.mass.gov slash masswildlife. And Tom has also put a link to them on your town website. Is that correct, Tom? Correct. OK. So with that, if we have some time for some questions from both, for both myself and Tom, we'd be happy to, to um, answer any questions or any concerns that you might have at this time. We can probably put the lights back on. Yes. Skunk problems in the 
stunt is going between the yards, between your yard yeah. and, an and, your and back. And back. The yep. stunt's going back and, and they forth. They wake me up. They leave. And they wake me up at two with the they snow. They wake me yeah. up. And they leave. Maybe two o'clock. I can tell them. <laughs> they wake me up. That? How do I stop that? So skunks are a very, very common suburban neighborhood backyard wildlife animal. Um, gen generally, they don't, it takes a lot for them. She also has the same You're thing. You're having the same thing. She has a yep. problem with the skunks yep. too. Yep. They will go in, in the wintertime. And has it been really only recently? Recently? More because recently. usually during the wintertime, they'll, they'll kind of hold up. And then on times. Years years. Yes, for years, right. Right, so they're a very, very common backyard animal, and the best thing you can do is figure out where they're hiding, where they're denning, probably under your porch, under a shed, and you have to, the only way really to stop that is to fence it, fence, you have to fence it underneath there so that it stops their, it's basically providing perfect habitat for them. Um, you can hire a problem animal control agent to come out and trap it, they're going to have to euthanize it. They can't, there's, moving wildlife is against the law in Massachusetts. So unfortunately, that sounds like it's probably habitat modification in that find any place where they're, they're using underneath, underneath decks, underneath, you know, or if they're, you know, that's, that's usually what the problem is, is, is they're using lots of people's backyards because there's lots of places to den, they're finding lots of food. Um, and so there's really no getting rid, you can get rid of individual animals um, by calling a problem animal control agent, but the long-term solution is to, to, um, to barrier off that habitat where they're hiding. Okay. And about, they have stayed in my area. They yeah. One time they were underneath the garden shed. Yep. So yep. We that out in a hurry. Yes. from the other person's backyard to uh, the park that's down the hill from my house. That, yep. that, that's what I mean yep. by expressway. Yes, so they're from so one place to another. Right, so they're going from your backyard down the hill. So your Not backyard, from my backyard from from through yard. it, through it. So your backyard is a travel corridor. No, that's what I said, the, the, yep. the common pa traveling yep. path. Yep, it's very, very difficult. You know, uh, unfortunately, they're a very, very common animal. Short of fencing your backyard, there's not really, if they're just walking through, it's, it's kind of hard to stop them from doing that. Um, other than, you know, putting up motion lights, putting up, maybe putting a radio out there, trying to do some sort of harassment techniques to, to deter them from using your backyard. Unfortunately, like I said, if they might learn pretty quickly, you know, the light that comes on when they start to come through the backyard isn't going to hurt them. So that's where you have to vary your technique. So skunks are a little difficult in that it's, they're so common in people's backyards. It's hard they're to stop They're not going to be them. common in my backyard. <laughs> so the other, the other thing is they don't tend to spray unless they're getting, unless someone's harassing them, like a, like a neighborhood dog or cat. So it tends to be they're defending themselves. And it takes a lot of energy for them to defend themselves. And so, um, it tends to be outdoor animals, you know, something is, is harassing it enough that they're spraying. So unfortunately, there's not really any good answers to stopping them from completely using your backyard, other than keep harassing them, keep at it. So, yeah. It's not what I want to hear. <laughs> it's not what I want to hear. Yeah. yeah. It's understandable. Any other questions? Right. Yes. Woodchucks. Woodchucks, same thing. They're a, you know a ubiquitous animal that's found in backyards. I think um, the hard thing with woodchucks is they they have a series of holes. They they have kind of a tunnel system, um, and so again they don't like to stray too far. Not too much actually preys on woodchucks because they don't tend to stray very far from that hole. And there's a tunnel system. Um, there are CO2 cartridges that you can buy in garden centers where you basically it, it's a flaming cartridge. You put it down the hole. You have to block off every entrance to it. It's going gonna, it's gonna to kill the animal, but that, that's kind of the, the ultimate solution to it is by, you know, killing the animal. But it's very, very difficult to deter them from that. I tried that because they've actually 
taken habitation underneath uh, my shed. Well, that's where you don't really want to use that. And you don't I really want to burn don't down want the shed. Because then that shed's attached to the house. So, yeah. you know, I put that yeah. in there, and all of a sudden I realize that, no, that's not a good thing to yeah, do. Yeah, so that's going to be more difficult. Is, is it a case I really need to get a, a trap for it? You can. You can certainly, but you can't, again, you could trap it. You have to either release it on your property or you have to euthanize it. So, oh, that's not a problem. I yeah. <laughs> so, there, there, there's a 100-year-old law that's Mass General Law, Chapter 131, Section 37, which basically says any animal that is causing damage to your property, and you need to be able to justify the damage, but if it's digging up your yard or it's under your shed, that counts as damage. You are allowed to um, destroy that animal by any legal means. So that's where you have to use traps that are legal, box or cage type traps. You can't use any foothold or any kill type trap. Um, so you have the right to do that under that law. How do I yes. kill it? Uh, it's going to be hard in a suburbanized area. You know, um, drowning is not illegal. That is one way to do it. Um, some, some pack agents have their own, you know, CO chambers, that sort of thing. But, um, you know, unfortunately, if you're in a, an area where there's no discharge bylaws in the town, and I'm not sure what the town of East Long Meadow has, um, where you can't shoot it because you're too close to houses or too close to the street, drowning, unfortunately, might be the only answer for you. Yeah, if I may, just uh, to add, to, uh, I, the questions that I receive are from folks, uh, I'm just going to go shoot it. The answer is no. Uh, don't, don't take it upon yourself to use a gun in a residential yeah. neighborhood to shoot an animal that's causing a nuisance to you. The other thing is that I hear is, I'm going to poison it. Please don't use no. poison. By doing that, you're poisoning not only that animal, but any, any other animals that feed on it. So that's uh, actually illegal. Right. Yeah. And, and it's yeah. not only is it bad practice, it's illegal. Right. And, and if I find right. out about it, then uh, there'll be some legal repercussions. Yeah. There, you know, there, we have, there's a 150-foot um, setback from a road where you can't discharge a firearm, 150 feet from a road, or 500 feet from a property owner's dwelling without permission of that property owner. So, unfortunately, in, in you know, more suburbanized towns like East Long Meadow, your options are limited. So. Do I really have to get a, uh, someone else then to take care of it? Because... Again, you have the right to destroy it yourself, but you have to be able to legally euthanize that and animal. And how do I get rid of it? Like I said, drowning might be your only option. But I mean, I now have a carcass laying mm -hmm. around. Yep, well that, you know, that there's lots of ways to get rid of a carcass. Okay, that's, that's not, that's not illegal. Let's not go that further. Yeah. Okay. So, any other questions? Yes. Let me get back there. Oh, no, I'm coming up. Oh, I'm coming up. oh okay. All right. The crows are flying over and coming in. The crows are coming in in the morning and at night they come back. Are they cleaning up some of the areas? Are they cleaning up some of the properties? What are they doing, the crows? They seem to be flying to clean up and eat something and then they come back and back and forth. I was just wondering about the crows, but about that culture for the crows. Mm -hmm. Um, from what I understand, there's actually a very large uh, roosting area in, it's either Long Meadow or East Long Meadow, where there's actually hundreds of, of crows and ravens that roost in the area. So it might be that you're seeing, you know, their, tra their normal travel pattern from where they're roosting at night to where they're feeding during the daytime. So again, they're another animal that is a scavenger. They're looking for all sorts of different food sources. Uh, but they will travel, you know, from where they're roosting at night to where they're feeding during the day. And from what I understand, there is a pretty big roosting area. I don't know where it is, but it is in either East Long Meadow or Long Meadow. So that might be what you're seeing. But crows, again, they're one of those suburban animals that do very yeah, well. Trees, yeah, with the lots trees. of them. With the trees, right. They're roosting in the trees. Yep. Yeah. So you're seeing lots of them. Yep. Yeah, that may very well be what you're seeing. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? Another question yeah. over here. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> 
Okay, I wanted to um, help answer the question about the woodchucks. You were talking about the woodchucks. That's right. You can't really deal with them. My husband and I bought um, like a a stick, like a stick, a long stick, and it made a lot of noise. It made some noises, and that was kind of driving the woodchucks mm -hmm. away. That helped. It was like a post, and you'd stick it in the ground. You put them in different places. They didn't like that. They didn't like that. Now it seems like they haven't been coming back, so that's just... There was just a pack, uh, maybe it was the father or something, I don't know. But anyway, we had um, the pack, and we, they, that got rid of them with so that post. noisy post Right, type harassment thing. techniques. Yeah. Maybe pie tins. Pie, try pie tins on a stick. Again, very, you know, and they may learn that it's, they don't, that, you know, they get used to it, so you have to do something different. But you can try any harassment technique for woodchucks as well. Whether or not it works is, you know, bounce, try it. See if it works. Um, you know, so. Any other questions about any sort of suburban wildlife, not just coyotes? What do coyotes have seen? Well, I'm sorry? Where, where are they? Yeah, there's been some yeah. observances of them. Where have they been? They're pretty much all over town. Yeah. Uh, they've been sighted uh, in, in the north, southeast, and west ends of town. And it could be the same family unit. As I said, they're using anywhere from 6 to 10 square miles. So they may be using you know, a certain part of town during one week or one time, and then they might move on. So it, it could be the, the same ones. It could be other transient individuals that are coming through the area. So they're not just using you know, your neighborhood. They're using you know, a, Coyotes are using most of a town, so they're going to be traveling. They don't travel the entire town in one week, but they'll be going to different areas. So, you know, it could be the same ones. It could be different ones. Yeah, we don't have any way of knowing if it's the same right. group or multiple groups, right. but the, the sightings have occurred simultaneously yeah. so that I know that there are at least yep. maybe uh, transient individuals yep. or two family yep. packs. Uh, groups in town. Right. Unlike deer that really don't maintain a territory where you may have a lot in one area, because they're a predator, because they are territorial, they're going to keep a lot of individuals from coming in an area. And as you can imagine, if they're utilizing one end of the town, you know, others might use part of that other end of town, but they're, they're not going to be a lot of them in the same area at the same time. They're going to drive them out of the area. So that's where you kind of limit your numbers that way, unlike deer, where you can have a lot in a, in a small area. Another yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Just hold on. Hold, um, thank you. <coughs> it's unusual that I see, what about moose? Are there, I, sometimes there's moose crossing in my land. I'm thinking, what, what's going on with that? Wait a minute. Is it a cow? What was that? It was a moose, a moose coming in my, in my area. I thought they were afraid of houses, and I thought they would stay out, but they didn't. They were coming in, too. It's very unusual to see the moose. Mm -hmm. Have you seen moose in this area, too? Moose have started moose? to come back into Massachusetts. Within the last um, at least 20 years, we've had a lot more moose in Massachusetts. Um, and we're finding them you know, in this part of the state, certainly, and it tends to be the younger individuals that are wandering into, you know, into more suburbanized areas because they're, you know, they're looking... the, the the big male moose, again, they're maintaining a little bit more of a territory. So they're, so these young ones are kind of going through. They're not the brightest bulb in the bunch, so they're just kind of you know, traveling through. And, and sometimes, unfortunately, they go through the middle of towns. And, and, and it, you know, we have problems when people start to gather to see these you know, beautiful animals. And they, caught, you know, they start a crowd. And so that's where it can be a public safety hazard when you get a moose, you know, in a in an urbanized area, and there's cars, and it's running around, and so that's where we have responded with environmental police in those situations to deal with that. But yeah, they're they're coming back. They don't, you know, they like wetland areas, so they're using wetlands, and 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 um, as their populations increase, they're using these areas, and they're getting into the some of these. Yes, exactly. Perfect. Yep. So. We have somewhere between 800 and 1,000 moose in Massachusetts. More and more black bears, too. Black bears are coming because in my area, um, 
we have um, food, we have farms and crops growing, and we have marshes, and um, the marshes come, and the black bear come, and they're eating that. They're eating the food. Yep. And the parents are trying to keep their kids back, and now they're asking, that where, where, where are the bears? And it's like, oh, wait a minute. We had to put it to sleep. We picked it up, and we moved the bear to another place. Yeah. But I was watching that. The bear's coming in, too. So the same thing. Black bear populations are are rising in Massachusetts. That's what I was doing yesterday. I was actually, we, we have 15 collared female bears in the state, and I was in the, in the middle of Northampton yesterday recollaring a female sow, and she had four cubs with her. So that tells you that there's a lot of food sources for them. And again, as their populations expand, they have to go into finding new areas. And some of these areas may not be great habitat, you think, for a black bear, but there's lots of food sources for them. There's lots of bird feeders. There's lots of dumpsters and things like that. So they're adapting to live really close to people as well. Yeah. We've yep. had, in regards to the black bears, we've had a few sightings in town. And it's mainly on the uh, north and, and east and southern sections of town. Uh, some are just handed lines yep. where people have seen them. And I imagine they're just moving through the area yep. feeding. Yep, yep. And, it, you know, some of the young males will, will wander in, and it tends to be the young males that kind of wander into the middle of cities. They're the ones that get in the most trouble because, again, they're trying to find their own territory. And so they're trying to find these areas that aren't the best bear habitat, but those are the ones that are getting kicked out of the territories that are already habitated by the big males, you know, that have established their territories. In the back. Yes. Absolutely. The question is, what about the Fisher cat? It's actually not a cat at all. Their their Fisher is a weasel. Um, people call him a Fisher cat. If you've seen a picture of him, I don't. I didn't have a picture in my slides, but they look a lot. They look very cat-like. They have kind of a, a little ears and and their heads kind of um, very cat-like. So. They are basically a three-foot-long weasel. They are very, very common in this part of the state. Um, you know, there's a lot of old wives' tales with fishers that you have to watch your baby carriage and, you know, keep your children inside, and that's not the case. They are a pretty voracious predator if you're a squirrel or a rabbit. But, yes, the same techniques would, would be the same. Um, you know, they're adapting. They live very close to people because of those food sources, and they're very um, adaptable in what they'll eat. So they'll get into fruit, they'll get into vegetables, um, chickens, and, and, you know, and unfortunately we know they'll take cats. So all those harassment techniques, they all pertain to fishers as well. So they're not something, they're, they're a pretty interesting animal. Um, and again, there's a lot, of, um, a lot of misinformation out there about fishers. We have some good information on our website as far as uh, what they are and kind of the do's and don'ts are very, very similar to the ones that I've, that I've talked about. But they're very, com they're actually pretty common. Um, they've been here since the 19, they've been in Massachusetts since the 1960s. They kind of started in North Central Mass and have made their way on their own throughout the state. Yep, yep. And so that, you know, we're finding them. We had, we had, um, when was that, 2009? We had a roadkill fisher on Beacon Hill in Boston. And then later that summer, it was roadkill, so it was dead. We had a, a, um, a caller complain because there was a fisher that was chasing squirrels in the public gardens. So it was a different individual animal. So they're just adapting to live very, very close to people. Yep, they've done really well. And nothing to worry about, but, you, you know, again, keep track of your pets and keep food supplies picked up for them. Yep. Okay. Yeah, I, I'd just like to add in, in closing on my end uh, that uh, our licensing period for dogs is ending on April 1st. Uh, actually, April 1st is the last day to register your dogs for this licensing year. So if you have not done so, it's important that you make sure your, your pet is vaccinated and your dog is licensed. And I would like to leave with those two thoughts in your mind to make sure that if you know anybody who hasn't done that, please encourage them to do so. Because not only are they endangering their animals and their family, but they're also endangering uh, their neighbors and their uh, fellow residents by not doing that. They're running around crazy, and they're, they're pets, they're neighborhood pets. Someone has a cat in the neighborhood, and they leave it out, and it's everyone's yard, you know, making, tearing it through a whole area. 
that has not been uh, addressed at a, a legislative level. So it's, it's not something that uh, we've been asked to uh, try to control. How do we do it? Through legislation, you need to talk to your lawmakers to have them pursue it. Certainly, that's, if you want to have a conversation about that, I'd be more than happy to, to have that conversation. Um, I just want to uh, thank everybody for their questions um, and also definitely for Mr. Tom O'Connor for his insightful information and Trina Macuzzi. Um, for coming in and giving us this helpful presentation. I hope it was as informative uh, for you as it was for myself. And uh, certainly if you have any further questions uh, and you're not, you weren't able to attend today, please make sure that you uh, contact the uh, Board of Health and we will make sure that Mr. Tom O'Connor gets to you or if he can't find the answer, he, I'm sure he will find, um, if he doesn't have the answer, I'm sure he will contact the people just like he did today to get the information to you so that you can have a safe and, and um, healthy cohabitation with our wildlife here in town. And I'd like to give him a nice hearty round of applause. Amen. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.